Hi folks, welcome to our paper about juxtaposition analysis and shale gauge ratio. This is work that Bill Power and I have been doing over the last three or four years. Hope you enjoy it. So I'm really sorry I couldn't make the conference. Uh, it's been tricky with flights given COVID. Some of the things I'm going to say people won't like. Fundamentally, scientific consensus is an oxymoron. This is not a popularity contest. What we do is we put four ideas and we break them. And that's how we progress. To put things in context, I'm going to be talking about trapping hydrocarbons over geologic timescales, hundreds of thousands of years to millions of years. All our studies, we use open file data, so you can check and break what we're saying. Importantly, we're standing on the shoulders of giants. All the ideas that have been put forward, we're playing with because people have taken time to put papers together. It's the scientific process to take those ideas, play with them and try and break them you have to break the ideas I put forward. I guess it's interesting though, because we're at the cusp of science and, and industry. To give an idea of this, here's the Ironbark prospect that was drilled in 2020. Uh, good data set was out there through uh, investor pack that Q Energy put out. Put that together pre-drill and we predicted a dry trap based on juxtaposition. The issue we've got though is how people look at risk. Study done data elicitation with around um, 200 participants, came up with a 77% chance that this would have hydrocarbons, but the problem would be about deliverability. Everyone should have been able to do those Allen maps, and they should have been able to see that there was a juxtaposition problem. This is where science diverges. What happens is we make a mistake in the oil and gas industry in the share price tanks. So the thing I started doing when I first into fault seal uh, 2001, trying to work out life, the universe, and everything. What's the SGR threshold? The state of the art was saying that the higher the SGR, the greater the continuous smear. If you have a look at the long strike variability, here's the fault through here. This is the hang wall, and this is the foot wall, so it's down thrown by 10 meters. We've got a large variability in fault rock thickness all the way along. But the most important thing with it is that every so often we have complete holes where we've got fractures going right the way across. So effectively, along this fault, we have, within centimetres, we have the same throw within that 10 metres. We have exactly the same stratigraphy, yet we have completely different thicknesses of fault rock. And that means that capillary seal is dictated by these holes. If we have a hole, we cannot have a capillary seal. And this algorithm just doesn't work. Now, we've seen this for a while. This is one of the first papers I remember seeing in the 1990s at the Leeds conference, uh, looking at the Moab fault. If you drop across a uh, set of gradients across this, because it's a log-log plot, you can see that effectively fault rock thickness and throw vary by about two orders of magnitude. There's nothing systematic about this. Ted Doherty threw and did a whole lot of mapping on this uh, New Mexico fault. Nicely posted up his strike variability. He's then had a go at trying to contour it up, and he has then compares that to the clay smear potential. It's interesting when you look at the algorithm, because you compare the algorithm to his original results, highest thicknesses of fault rock here, modeled highest in here. There's no correlation. If you have a look at his intermediate thicknesses, there is no correlation. We've effectively got six centimeters, 190 centimeters, and zero centimeters, and 30 centimeters, 24, and then 850. We've got a lot of variability in here that is non-systematic. Sylvia de Rosa and Zoe went and did the whole lot of measurements in Miri, and what we see in loose correlation at three meters. We have holes every five meters. 60 meter throw fault, lateral variability that's much greater than the algorithms. Gabby Watson did a great PhD in New Zealand in the Taranaki and says, well, the algorithms don't give us an idea about where the holes are and they don't work. Are we in the process of rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic? So we sat and thought, well, let's have a look at the across fault pressure difference. This is a really nice plot and the guys at Badley should be commended for producing it because it's an iconic plot which shows that the increase in shale gauge ratio uh, can be related to an increase in a crosswalk pressure difference. But what we've been able to do is go and look at the data sets behind it. Nun River field in the Niger Delta is Vieira et al. Uh, talking about Shell's interpretation software that proved their 3D picking. Taking an individual fault, they went 75 meters in the hang wall till they had coherent reflectors and element in the L map, going 75 meters the, and then sandwiched them together. That means they're 150 meters apart. And given the geometry of these fields, that's a big difference. We started out with the paper and we looked at the foot wall with the known hydrocarbon water contacts, digitized that. And you can see these are some of the significant top seals. 
associated with potential trapping. And when we put that on top of overall Allen map, things didn't match up. We've got zones in here with trapped columns which are juxtaposed by primary seal. Fundamentally, these Allen maps don't add up. We went and looked at uh, Yielding's 1997 paper. We saw similar issues. There is no description in either papers how they go from SP to V shale. And that's a fundamental transform that you need to calculate shale gouge ratio. So we can't replicate this cross plot because primary juxtaposition issues don't allow us to do AFPD. Shale gouge ratio we can't get to because of primary juxtaposition issues and we don't understand the transform between SP and V shale. We had a look at the Osterberg field. Pete Breton again, thanks for publishing a good paper. He gives us a good cross section, he gives us a map, and he gives us stratigraphy. He thought we could do better. We went to the NPD and they gave all the logs, the RFT data, and we can also see where the perforation and DSTs were. What we see with this is that for the upthrown 13 well, the notional foot wall, the best test is actually up in here. For the 14 hangwall well, it's way down in here. Look at the map, 20 meters above the map, Miss Ty, and we're talking about 60 meters below. So this is not a top reservoir map. And this is important when you're doing a trap analysis. Importantly as well, we could see that there was a stratigraphic relation to, the, to this. Were we seeing lateral facies change? Well, not Robinson Crusoe. We know that the Tarbot is a shore face sand. And we've known this for a really long time before all these papers were published. The Tarbot sand is related to sea level changes and to block rotations of major fault blocks. So we're going to end up with multiple Tarbot sands. It's an environment. This is not sheet sand. It shouldn't be correlated to sheet sand. So we then went and had a look at the pressure test data. In the original paper, there's the AFPD. Here's a anonymized pressure plot without um, depth. Now we're sitting there going, well, all this data was available. This was all in the public domain at the time. You know, maybe we're wrong, but our understanding is that you know these wells should have been out there. We've got a good gradient in the 13 well, and we've got a lot scattered in the 14 well. You can see these don't really look similar. But most importantly, when Bill went and plotted all the data up, you could see in the 14 well there were a significant number of tight and overpressured tests. That shows we don't have flow. We're going to put this together, and we can see in the 13 well good grass good clear oil and water. That's our hydrostatic, so we know we're slightly overpressured, but we'd be putting a, potentially put a water and oil in there. Really, this gradient in here is supported on one pressure point, and this area in here is suspect. The whoa moment for me was then sitting there going, okay, when Bill went and grabbed the wells for um, seven, eight, and 10, which are inboard and therefore deeper, and what we saw is we saw another systematic water gradient. So effectively, this is geopressure, hydrostatic, shallow, deeper, deeper, and we end up with a con consistent stacking in aquifer pressure. And that's because these are independent, separate sands that can't lose water pressure. They are not correlatable sands. Is this 9.5 bar real? And we don't think it is. That then puts doubt on this diagram because it's really based on one point. So we then said, okay, well, let's go and have a look at the geometry. And we've known for a long time how the BCU goes through and erodes the Brent. Um, and Pete quite rightly put in his cross section showing exactly this sort of feature where it's eroded and faulted. We took the map and we could see that we've got a distinct displacement anomaly. And this is where you really need membrane seal to try and explain the 13 well. So we took the 1997 Allen map, which shows the BCU coming across the top here. And we put it into structural restoration package and we restored it. By unfolding the Allen map, uh, we were then able to reconstruct a foot wall and a hang wall, put them back together again so they made sense. And that allowed us to then get a new displacement profile. When we use that to do a juxtaposition diagram, we end up with our leak point way down here below the observed oil water contact. This fault can't be controlling it. It rolls back to this fault or some other stratigraphic feature, which we don't know about. Similarly, for the 14 well, the notional uh, hang wall well, we saw the same effect. We suggest that we went and had a look at the Toon field. We're not a million miles away. That's where we're looking at Osseberg, and we're now looking at Toon down here. A LinkedIn post had been suggesting, oh, look, you know, this 322 bar pressure difference 
coming across the relay ramp. Let's go and check. 2002 paper shows this significant pressure difference uh, with the pressure plot. Kudos, it's actually got points on it rather than being notional. The map has no contour values. So we had to use the deviation surveys to back calculate these values were, and from that try and guesstimate the contours using the surrounding wells. We really need maps that have contours so we can count them. It might seem as though I'm special needs, but that's how we check the fault displacement. We can see is an area here with no throw. It's well and truly within the target thickness and seismic resolution. Using the 2002 paper, they used a 30 centimeter fault rock and that's much thicker than we would use based on um, Sylvie's work at Miri and an incredibly low permeability. Using a Darcy flow calculation, if we use 0.1 millidarcy, we're ending up with you know, hundreds of thousands of cubic meters of water per day flowing across this fault, and that would dissipate the pressure. Even with low permeabilities, we're still ending up with hundreds of cubic meters a day will significantly deplete the pressure and take you off the geopressure gradient. Bill went through and potted all the data up. Whilst this has some of the data, it doesn't have all of the data. Different water oil legs sitting in here. And this is not a simple system. It makes us think much more about the stratigraphic model. The MPD allows us to go through and get information about oil and gas. And what we can see in this well is we've actually got gas, this one's got water. And what would say, given this geometry, is that we've got about 250 meter gas column on a relay ramp, and that doesn't seem tractable. NPD maps show these as being separate fields with a stratigraphic variability cutting across contours between these two wells. It's going to be really interesting to see what happens with the Oswick well that's just been drilled. Some of the junior partners were saying that this was all to do with fault seal. We would be actually arguing, well, this is actually a bunch of stratigraphic traps on fault blocks and this model of continuous two parallel sets of sands doesn't make sense. You know, we're not very far away from Toon and Osseberg um, and we would expect given that they're deeper, that they, their water pressures should appear at a slightly higher of a pressure. Now, as many of you know, over the last few years, Bill and I have been doing a lot of work on validating SGR and juxtaposition. Back in 2018, we presented these slides which show that juxtaposition analysis massively outperforms shale gouge ratio. Shale gouge ratio just gets the wrong answer with a much wider spread of solutions. We've developed an extensive database of many fields, including dry wells, where we can show that juxtaposition analysis provides a modal error of less than 15 meters. Gone through and compared SGR and juxtaposition on the Gulfax field. The paper has little or no useful data. We have a poster map, a cross section that gives us fluid contacts, which is great, and a very, very simplified log. At the same time, or earlier, public domain, there's been a model in both IRAP, RMS, and then in Patrol. So our observations aren't on the papers data set, but on the public domain data set. For the Tarbot, we end up with an 18 meter error using juxtaposition. We end up with a 14 meter error for the Cook. And for the Hangwall um, Cook, we end up with a 54 meter error, which is a bit higher than we'd want. We'd want it more in this part of the distribution. What's interesting though, is that juxtaposition outperforms SGR, 18 to 130, Cook, 14 to 22, Tarbot, 54 to 62. Juxtaposition outperforms it. Getting it wrong in the oil and gas industry is an issue with the shareholders. Getting it wrong with carbon capture and storage and, and groundwater, we're gonna have a problem with regulators. But most importantly, if we can't get on and make sure that we've got future trustworthy data, we're gonna have issues with landholders and the general public. Fundamentally, we know that juxtaposition works. So why do we keep over-promising with SGR? The key controls in hydrocarbon fault seal are seal thickness, reservoir thickness, and fault geometry. Let's just get on with doing the basic things we know we can do. The known unknowns are we can't collect fault core easily and permeability measurements and fault rock thicknesses in the outcrop are potentially suspect. Just a case of doing good work, not getting too complicated. Thanks again to the co-authors and to the many customers who've funded the R&D for this project. If you've got any questions, please feel free to contact me via email or via LinkedIn. Thank you again for listening.